someone give a first to first and uh, one other party that just uh, encouraging the first offer and the condition is narrow to the anchoring object. Yes, so the first offer, the price will be around the first offer. Okay, so this is a psychological problem. So then close any website which you were looking at before the class. Okay. So we talked about, we finished up talking about when there's a stalemate. Okay, we bring in the relevant fact about the object. Okay. So then let's continue. So we have the midpoint rule. Do you understand mid midpoint? Midpoint. So if you start somewhere and I start somewhere, then the chances are usually we'll end up in the middle. Okay? So you say the price 30 and I say the price 10 at the start. My first offer, your first offer. Where is the price going to be in the end? 10, 20. That's called the midpoint rule. Okay? So the midpoint is between the first offer and the first counter offer. It's a good predictor of the ultimate outcome of negotiation if the midpoint is in the zone path. So if you've done your preparation, you've figured out a target price. So choose your counter offer so that the midpoint is equal to your tar target price. Right? So let's say that they offer 30. Right? And your target price is going to be 20. Right? So then what, what are you going to say to them first? 20? 10. This is your target price and their offer, right? Their first offer is 30. This is your target price. So you're going to say? 10. 10, right? Your first offer. So that's the mid-price rule. Okay, you don't say 15 or 19. What will happen if you say 15? You can end up at 23, right? In the middle. So try to make, this is a midpoint rule. Do you understand midpoint rule? Yes. So we want to get our target price. So here's a question. <coughs> you're trying to buy a company and the target price is $10 per share, but they ask for $30 per share. Now what are you going to say? How are you going to respond? Because you can't say the midpoint, you can't say minus 10. You have to give me 10. Right? That would be the, mid, the midpoint group. So how are you going to respond in this case? So I'll discuss with your partner. So you're going to buy a company, you want to pay me $10 for the company, and I start off with the first offer of 30. Okay, so how are you going to respond? And number two, how can you avoid the anchoring effect? So you say, 
defensive, I'm not going to buy, I'm going to leave to negotiate. Okay? So, you can politely and clearly communicate that you are ruling the offer out of consideration, right? Do you understand? You can use humor, non-verbal cue, using your body language to show that... How would you use your body language to show the offer is ridiculous? Yeah, it's a ridiculous offer. How would you use your body language? What would you do? Okay, ask me, ask me the price, I say 30, and then without using any words, try to make some body language, right? So ask me, what's, your, what's the price you want? What's the price you want? $30 a share. <laughs> <laughs> Only you did body language, nobody else? Oh, you're going to just sit there? Okay. What body language are you going to do? Shake hands. Shake head. Shake your head. How could you use humor? You have to be careful with humor, right? Sometimes it's a different culture. They don't understand your humor, right? But you could make a joke like, Maybe I can cut off my hand and give you my hand, right? Not a very funny joke. One way to deal with that, right? So we have to let the counterpart know their offer is unaccept completely unacceptable. If we do, some people, they just, they're very polite and they just listen and they write down and they don't say anything, they write down the offer, right? Then what's the problem? Then that becomes the anchor, right? 30 is now the anchor and we're starting from 30. So. You have to let them know it's unacceptable. Or you can make a very observed counteroffer, like one dollar. Okay, then I'll pay you one dollar, right? Sometimes you can just say, walk away, say I'm sorry, you're not giving me a reasonable starting point, so I'm I'm not going to continue to negotiate today. Come back to me when you have a reasonable offer. Do you understand? So we we can't we have to try to avoid. So Discuss the number two. How can you avoid the anchoring effect? If somebody makes this ex very extreme demand, how can they want to make the anchor around 30. How can you avoid it becoming an anchor? So discuss with your partner. You don't want to allow this to be an anchor. So how can you avoid it being an anchor? Don't look at the answer, right? Just look at the question. discussion. Do you understand the metric? We're going to look at an example, right? So even though we, we made a clear refusal of the other side, we said that no, we, we, we don't accept this offer at all, right, very clearly. But it still stays there as an anchor, right? The number can still be there as an anchor. Uh, so we need to change the metric that we discuss, so to make the anchoring less. So we're going to look at an example here to understand that idea. So an entrepreneur, we looked at this times many in the times in the class, right? Entrepreneur wants to sell his company, or her company, okay? So he was hoping for a price of about 40 million. He wants to sell his company for 40 million, software company. So the investment bankers are buying on behalf of another company. So they make this phrase. We've made 19 acquisitions. Do you understand acquisition? Buying, 
software firms this year, and we never paid more than 10 to 12 times earnings. Do you understand the earnings? Profits. Less some discounts. So that means the price would be about 15 to 18 million. But we want 40 million. So what's the problem here? When they say 15 to 18 million, we might anchor around 15 to 18 million, and the entrepreneur could just think, oh, maybe I'll just get 25 million in the end, or 22 million, or 23 million, right? Yeah. So this is the first offer that can have the anchoring effect. He was thinking 40 million, but they said 15 to 18, and they had this reason, this metric, which is price to earnings. Do you understand price to earnings? Yes. So I earned this much in one year. I earned 10 million dollars, let's say. I earned 1.5 million in a year, right? Then the price is going to be 10 times my profit multiplied by 10 equals 15 million, right? That's one way to work out the value of the company. So that's a metric. But the sellers prepared the discounted cash flow analysis. So if you studied the financial management, then you studied about the discounted cash flow, right? So this is changing the metric. So they made a valuation of the company close to 40 million. Okay? So the discounted cash flow for the next 10 years, okay, and then equals to this value. So the company is going to grow and grow and grow and grow, right? So a different metric. Do you understand this idea? So you change the information. So the metric changed from price to earnings to discounted cash flow analysis. So we changed the way of calculating the price, the metric. So then the bankers started to be anchored around this one, the new metric. And for the rest of the negotiation, they were negotiating down from a high price rather than up from a low price. So this is the key point. We don't want to be negotiating around this anchor, up from here. But they said that price first, and even they had a reason. Okay? So how can we deal with that? We need to change the reason, change the metric. Okay? So different reason different metric, different way of calculating, we make this price, okay? And then if the bankers accept, then maybe this becomes the anchor. And we're negotiating from 40 million down instead of 20 million up, okay? If we negotiate down from the high price, we can end up with 35 million, 30 million, okay? If we negotiate up from the low price, we could end up with 22 million, 25 million, okay? Do you understand the difference? Yes. So we're fighting over the anchor. Who gets to do the anchor? Okay, so they try to do the anchoring, but we try to deal with that by changing the metric, the way of calculating for the anchor. Do you have any question about that? That one? Do you think you can do that? Somebody makes the anchor and you refuse their anchor and try to make your own one, using different reason, reasons, right? So you want to negotiate around this one and not around this one. Okay. So then let's look at the next uh, psychological tool. Do you have any other comments about anchoring before we move on? Just uh, another story about anchoring. They went, even the very smart people like doctors do anchoring. So they went into the hospital and they showed some doctor some picture of the lung, lung cancer. Do you understand lung cancer? Okay, so they asked the doctor, does this patient have more than 20% chance of lung cancer or less than 20% chance of dying? Right? Do you understand what death? Yes. yes. Right? Higher or lower than 20%. Okay? And then they asked the doctor to write down the number. And then they went to another hospital. And they, asked, they gave the same picture of the lung cancer to the doctor. But they asked the doctors, does this person have a higher or lower chance of 80% of dying? Right? So then they asked them, higher or lower, and give me a number. Okay? So the, the higher or lower doesn't matter. The doctor's number was all or near to 30%, 20% here. When they gave the number, it was around 35%. Right? When the doctors gave the number here, it was around 65%. Right? Do you understand? It was the same picture, the same picture of the lung cancer. Why did the doctors give the different? This group of doctors said 65%. This group of doctors said 35%. Why? It's 
anchoring. Anchoring, right? They gave them this completely random, you understand, random, completely random number here, and random number here is higher or lower than this. So the doctor is even anchored around that, that one. Okay? So that anchoring is a strong psychological tool. Okay? So we can use that in the negotiation. Do you have any other question or comment about anchoring? Do you think you can use that? On Thursday you're going to do the negotiation, right? Uh, so then let's move into the next one, overconfidence. So we're going to do a little quiz, just take out your pen and paper. So, do you understand the range? Yes. The range is from, let's say, 1 to 100, right? Range. Or it can be from 10 to 20. Okay? So, I'm not going to ask you for 100% confidence, I'm asking you for 90% confidence, okay? So if I ask you, you're 100% sure that between these two years Mozart was, was born, right? Maybe you would say, oh, I'm 100% sure it's between 10,000 and now, right? 2015. I'm 100% sure of this range that Mozart was born in this year, right? Would you be 100% sure that Mozart was born between these two years? Yes. Yes, right? But I'm asking you for 90%, so you need to be more precise, okay? So maybe 90% you might say, I don't know, right? You have to answer the question. You're 90% sure, 10% you could be wrong, but you're 90% sure Mozart was born between these two years, okay? So write down the answer for the first question. You're 90% sure that Mozart was born between this year and this year. Just, you're not 100% sure, but you might be a little bit wrong, right? It might be just outside, but you're 90% sure about it. So write down the range, not the number, range, from this year to this year. You understand range? Yes. Did you write down the range? Yes. Two numbers, from this year to this year. Between this year and this year. Okay? 90% confident between this year and what other year? Do you know Mozart? Yeah. Yes. Do you like Mozart? Yes, no. Why? You never met him. <laughs> yeah. Do you like Mozart's music? What about the length? Write right down to mile or kilometers. Okay, then continue with the rest of the questions, right? So write down in kilometers the length of the Nile River. You're ninety percent sure, right? I could say I'm a hundred percent sure. The length is between ten kilometers and one hundred thousand kilometers. I'm a hundred percent sure, right? But ninety percent sure. What is the length of the Nile River? The number of Languages spoken in the world. The length of time a snail can sleep. Do you understand a snail? Yes. If it is not disturbed. The number of knives, forks, and spoons in the White House. Do you know the White House? Yes. In the US? So write down a range for each one. Okay, don't search on Google. Or <laughs> 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 Do you like? Do you eat snails in Korea? Uh, hmm? Some people eat the snails. Isn't it escargot? In France they eat snails, but not in Ireland. Have you ever eaten snails? Yes. Yes. Do they taste nice? Yes. You can ask him, why are you asking me?
I'll write down the range. You're 90% sure, right? 90% sure, right? Let me just take another 30 seconds. We're not going to spend too long writing down the answers. Just take another 30 seconds. So it means that you should get 4 out of the 5 should be correct, right? 90% is 4 out of 5. So if you're finished, give your page to the other person they're going to write the correct. See if you got the correct answer. So swap your page with your partner. Mine is finished. Somebody wrote hours here, it should be days and days. is a good thing. Entrepreneurs can have the vision to convince people to join their company and investors and to start a company, right? We can also see the best in people and help the people. But when we're doing decision making, overconfidence can be a problem, okay? Let's say I go horse racing, okay? Oh, I'm going to bet on that horse because it's green. It's going to win because it has a green color. Green is my look of color. Put all my money on the horse. <laughs> can be a problem, right? I'm very confident, then I lose all my money. Or in the stock market, right? People think, oh, I know this company. It's a great company, Volkswagen. <laughs> They're going to go up. The price is going to go up. Volkswagen, they have a new car, new edition. It's going to be great, right? Really confident. I know best, invest in Volkswagen. Then I lose my money. Oh, I made a mistake, changed to another company. But that company, this time, they're going to be very good. So often a problem in the stock market, people is overconfident about their own ability to, to choose. So they end up paying a high transaction cost because they keep buying and selling the stock. Whereas they might just leave the stock, like Warren Buffet suggests. Just leave in the, in the S&P 500 and let it grow, right? But people think, no, I know better. 
I know a better, so I'm going to change my stops every day. Okay? They're too confident. So, uh, we have to be careful about overconfidence. And we, one thing that can help us is to find the disconfirming evidence. Do you understand disconfirming? Confirming, disconfirming? Yes. Confirming, that's true. Right? Showing that it's true. Disconfirming, showing it's not true. <laughs> so, we all fall into this trap of find, trying to find confirming evidence rather than disconfirming evidence. So, I asked before earlier in the class, if you love somebody but they have a very different view about everything, is it okay? Can you get married? And you said yes, right? So maybe you, they say love is blind. Do you understand love is blind? Yes. So when people love each other, they try to ignore the disconfirming evidence and just remember the confirming evidence, right? So disconfirming evidence, maybe I'm really clean and she's really messy, okay? But I just ignore that part and then I like the confirming evidence, like we both like potatoes. Right? We both like potatoes, the marriage is going to be great. Do you understand? Uh, yes. Well, uh, there's a lot of disconfirming evidence, right? Like, uh, she likes spending money and I like saving money, right? Or that kind of thing, right? But I don't think about disconfirming evidence, just uh, the both of our names start with C. So it's going to be great, right? Do you understand? People look for the evidence which is confirming. Do you do that? Hmm? Do you guys do that? Confirming you like some person, just ignore the, anything that could be bad, try to pretend it doesn't exist, and then just try to confirm the good things. You don't do that? You're not overconfident? How many points did you get in the test? <laughs> Zero. Oh, I see. So, we have to try to avoid this trap, okay? So we do the same for investments or making decisions. So that's why great leaders like Steve Jobs, they have different style, but Steve Jobs always wanted to be surrounded by people who challenge their thinking, right? So for example, Steve Jobs says, we're going to invest in this project. It's going to be a watch. You put on the watch, and you can use the watch as a smartphone, right? And then everybody says, oh Steve, that's a great idea, yes, people are going to love that because they can wear the watch and use the watch as a smartphone. It's a good idea, Steve, right? Then Steve Jobs does the idea, right? But maybe there's somebody who says, but hold on a minute, Steve, if you wear the watch, then the screen is too small and you can't use the thing well, so maybe people is not interested in using the watch as a smartphone, right? Or the battery is too heavy. Right? Battery is very heavy. People don't want such a heavy watch. Okay? So that's the disconfirming evidence. So we can make a better decision. Don't launch the smartwatch. Right? That kind of thing. Do you understand that idea? So yes. we're, we're, we, do you want people who always agree with you or people who have different ideas than you different when you're making decisions? Right? Different ideas. So it's the same when any project or when we're doing interviews or even negotiating. We should build a team, uh, diversify the team. So we should have women and men, right? Because women and men have a different way of thinking sometimes, right? So when we're doing interviews, we should have not only men, just also women, okay? Or on the team. We should have people from different race, from different backgrounds, okay? One problem in the financial crisis, people who was making decisions was all 45-year-old white men who went to the same universities, okay? then there, nobody is making the disconfirming evidence. Everybody is just saying, yes, that's right, okay? So, one way we can avoid this problem, okay? So let's look at this question. I'm thinking of three numbers, two, four, and six, okay? Two, four, six. So I have a sequence of numbers in my head. Sequence, you understand sequence? Yes. And I have a rule that I use to make this sequence. So I want you to guess what the rule is in my head and continue the sequence, okay? So add three numbers to my sequence to test the rule and try to find the rule, okay? So test me, add three more numbers, check if it's the rule. Is it eight? 
Eight. Three more numbers. Eight, ten, twelve. Eight, ten, twelve. You think it's eight, ten, twelve? No, that's not it. That's not it. That's not the rule. Goes up by two. No, that's not the rule. One, three, five. Hmm? One, three, five. I said uh, the next numbers is I'm more than six. One, three, five. Okay, that's not it. Not one, three, five. This is the rule, and you try to confirm your rule. Well, everybody says this because it looks like going up by two. Okay? So you just try to confirm your rule. But I say no, you didn't learn anything, really. Right? So we should look for disconfirming evidence. So you should uh, try to find the disconfirming evidence first, and then you can say that this is not, not going to be the rule, right? If you only have one guess, right? try to look for confirming evidence and this rule is going to be wrong. So we should look for disconfirming evidence first, right? So let's say I want to invest in the stock market and I say, oh the Japanese central bank put down the interest rate, okay? So I'm going to invest in the stocks. Is that good enough? No. No, no that's just confirming evidence. But I didn't look at the other disconfirming evidence, right? Why is they putting down the interest rate? Right? Maybe Japan's productivity is going down after the earthquake, or they have some problem, right? So I can't just make my decision based on the confirming evidence. I have to look at the disconfirming evidence, right? So what do you think? You meet a really nice and beautiful girl, and it, everything is great. You're going to get married. What are you going to do? Just look at all the confirming evidence? Check the disconfirming evidence. Check the disconfirming evidence. Right? Am I going to ruin your life now? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you meet some very beautiful and nice girl, and then you check all the disconfirming evidence. <laughs> so break up. <laughs> break up immediately. It's not good. Right? Mm -hmm. But just we have to be aware, right? We don't look, don't, don't just only look at disconfirming evidence. Don't only look at confirming evidence. We have to look at disconfirming evidence too, right? and don't try to ignore the disconfirming evidence, okay? A lot of women say they can change men, right? They make something in their head, oh, I can change the guy later, do you understand? Yes. Maybe now he's going out drinking till 4 o'clock and he plays a PC game all day and just sits around doing nothing, but it's okay, I can change him, after we get married he'll change. <laughs> what do you think? Is that possible? Change the guy after he gets married? What? Yes, you're not saying no, right? <laughs> then you can change him. Then that's, you're not thinking about disconfirming. Just ignoring the disconfirming evidence, right? It's going to be okay. Just he's nice. He's a nice guy. He's handsome. He's rich. So it's going to be okay, right? Then it doesn't change. It can be a problem, right? What do you think? Could you change your behavior? I mean, never change. <laughs> They're, they look worried now. They did, did you know that men, it's hard to change the men? It's hard to change men, did you guys know that? Women are the same, right? So don't ignore the disconfirming evidence, right? Uh, so in the negotiation too. So then let's look at the next part, framing. Do you understand framing? Frame? What is a frame? Frame. Picture is in the frame. Does the picture look better in the frame or worse in the frame? Better. Better. So we put the frame around the picture to make it change how it looks, change the perception. 
it looks better or it looks worse depending on the frame. So it's the same for the question. We can make things look better, options look better or worse, depending how we make the question. Okay? There's a lot of debate when there's a vote. How should we write the question? Okay? Because framing is important. So the way that options are framed can cause us either to be risk averse if there's a positive frame or risk seeking if there's a negative frame. So let's look at an example. So choose here. I'll give you a gift. Either $250 in an envelope or you have four envelopes on the table. One envelope has $1,000 three envelopes are empty. Which option are you going to choose? Okay, hands up, who's choosing the first one? You have to choose quickly. Who's choosing the second one? You guys didn't put up your hands. First one or second one? Hmm? 250 or a chance to win 1,000 from four? Which? You want to take a chance? You can end up with nothing? Okay, then most people is one. Then the next one, you have to pay a traffic fine. You, can, you have to pay the 250 or you can choose on the table an envelope. One envelope has the fine, you understand fine? Yes. $1,000. But three envelopes is empty. What are you going to do? Number one or number two? Second. <laughs> Hands up. Second? Why did you change? Because it's the same thing. It's dangerous to, to give a fine. Hmm? It has a chance to, uh, doesn't give any charge of the uh, $10,000. There's a chance that you don't have to pay anything, but you could have to pay a thousand. So actually the results is the same in these two, right? But people usually choose like this. They choose number one in the first one, and they choose number two in the second one. Okay? So framing the things in the positive way or the negative way is uh, uh, going to affect the outcome. Okay? Uh, so we said at the start, if there's a positive frame, we're risk averse. This one is positive, right? We can get this much. If it's a negative, then we want the risk. We look for the risk more in that case. So then let's look at these ones. Questions. You're the director of a clinic. You're preparing for the outbreak of a disease. The disease is going to kill 600 people in your area. With this program A, you're going to save 200 of the 600 people. Program B, there's a 33%, one-third chance you will save all 600, but there's a two-thirds chance you will save nobody. Which one are you going to choose? Discuss with your partner. Program A or Program B? Choose program B. Program. Let's try again. Who's going to choose program A? One, two, three. Who's going to choose program B? Nobody. Try again. There's seven students. Just three students voted. <laughs> Who's going to choose program A? You waited to see what the other people would do and then copy. No. Okay. Let's look at the next one. Choose between program C and program D. Program C. 400 people are going to die. Program D, there's a one-third chance that nobody will die, and a two-thirds chance 600 people will die. Which program are you going to choose? C or D? If you choose C, 400 people will die. If you choose D, there's a third chance that nobody will die, and a two-thirds chance 600 people will die. Isn't it the same possibility? I <laughs> don't <laughs> 
Which one are you going to choose? Which one are you going to choose? Hands up, program C. 400 people are going to die? Right, hands up, program D. Ch change your mind. The same thing. Why did you change your mind? Why did you change your mind? Because of the framing of the question. Here we says, we'll save 200 of 600. Sounds good, right? Sounds positive. Here it says 400 people are going to die. Don't want to do that. That's 400 people dying. I want to save 200 people. <laughs> right? But it's the same thing. Okay? And then on the other side it's similar, right? There's a one third chance you'll save the people, and here there's a one third chance people will die. But it's the same thing, just frame differences. So some people change their mind because of the framing. Okay? So. You have to be careful about how you frame the question. Okay? In a positive way or a negative way, it can affect the answer. Do you think you're affected by framing? Are you affected by framing? So far, you've been caught by everything by anchoring, by framing, by overconfidence. Right? We're doing all these little tricks. So, can you understand the psychology is important? Yes. In the negotiation, too? Right? So we need to frame the thing in the correct way so that people will accept our proposal, right? If I want to do this, a program A, which am I going to say? We can save 200 people or 400 people will die? Save 100. Of course, right? I'm going to frame it in a better way. So it's the same in negotiation. You have to try and frame things in the positive way, okay? And then their, their side, you have to frame in a bad way, right? Their side, you say, but there's a two-thirds chance you're going to save nobody, right? So try to frame it, their one in a bad, in a bad way, okay? So next question, are there more deaths each year in the United States from motor vehicle accidents or lung cancer? So don't look at the answer. Talk with your partner. What do you think? More people die from lung cancer, pay out, or more people die from motor vehicle accidents? Hands up who thinks lung cancer? Hands up who thinks motor accidents? Why did you say lung cancer? Uh, in the United States, I think many smokers. So just 34,000 deaths for motor vehicle accidents and 160,000 deaths to cancer. That's why in Ireland the tax is very high on cigarettes, 1,000% tax. Because the government pay, has to pay a lot of money for the people who get sick from lung cancer from smoking, right? Do you guys smoke? Yeah. No? Good. Do you guys smoke? <laughs> okay. So, why do most people select... Why were you all wrong again? You keep getting caught. And right one time not to get caught. <laughs> the psychological trick. Pick the opposite one, then what do you think, right? Yeah. Next question, pick the opposite one. <laughs> why, why do you think you picked the motor vehicle accidents? Because the accident is more dramatic. <laughs> accident is more dramatic, so you remember more. Yes, so you retrieved information that led you to select motor vehicle accidents. 
Maybe you saw on the news or read in the newspaper or saw somewhere. So the next psychological concept is availability. People retrieve information about something which biases your decision. So whatever I can easily find the information for, this biases my decision, right? So I want to invest in Japanese stock markets. I can very easily see this, the interest rate is going down, right? That's easy information. Invest in Japan, right? But the hard information, I don't look for the hard to find information. Do you understand? I bias, you understand bias? So the easy to find information bias people. They work on the easy to find information and they don't think about the other harder to find information. Okay, even if there is a, some evidence, you know, in opposite evidence. Do you understand that idea? Yes. Do you have that kind of thing? Problem? Okay. So the next class uh, was one student was absent at, in the last class. 